My name is Nathan Brown and I'm a junior here at Mines. Today I'll be talking about my progress on understanding influence of heat treatment on serrated yielding in a nickel-based super alloy. This project is sponsored by Honeywell and ATI and my faculty advisors are Amy and Kester Clark. Some nickel-based super alloys experience serrated flow at certain temperature regimes and this phenomenon will result in an increasing strain with a nominal change in stress. The objective of this project is to understand at what processing and testing conditions serrated flow occurs at and the mechanisms involved. A greater understanding of this type of deformation can improve the mechanical properties of nickel-based superalloys, leading to a more efficient and better performing turbine engine. Since the fall, I've acquired two different types of powder processed nickel-based superalloys, which I'll be going into a little bit more detail later on. I've also been working on reducing the thermal gradients in my testing setup, and I've started initial characterization of the material. I'd like to note that I'm supported by the Mines Undergraduate Research Fellowship, which helps pay for the work that I'm currently doing. So nickel-based superalloys are utilized in many different applications, some of which are the aerospace, oil and gas, and medical fields. They're especially utilized for turbine engine discs because they exhibit high strength and a long fatigue life. They're also resistant to oxidation and corrosion at high temperatures, which makes them really useful to be used in the aerospace applications. These images on the right here are two different nickel parts used in turbine engines, and these alloys can be processed in many ways, two of which are, could be rot or powder. There's an interest in both of these processing techniques because while powder processing can control properties better, it's a more time-consuming and expensive process. My work, will, my work will determine how these processing techniques affect the yielding of each alloy and how the microstructural evolution influences serrated flow. To understand serrated flow, we must first look at a similar deformation known as the yield point phenomenon. This, this causes a sample to exhibit an increasing strain while at a constant load and occurs because at the yield point, interstitial or substitutional atoms will fill dislocations which immobilizes them, in turn causing an increase in stress. This process is referred to as the cultural atmosphere, and then, when enough stress is applied to unstick the dislocations, a lower yield point will form. This can be seen on the graph here as a large drop in stress from about 500 MPAs to just below 300 MPAs. After this drop, the material experiences an increase in strain at a constant stress, and that can be seen on the graph at point labeled 3 to point 6. This uniform deformation is caused by the formation and propagation of Luger's bands, and once these bands have propagated throughout the whole material, it will resume normal deformation until fracture. So here we can see an example of how Luter bands propagate, and this image shown was taken using thermography measurements on a round bar of S235 structural steel. We can see that the temperature of the sample increases as the Luter bands propagate throughout it, and this propagation is due to that high mobile dislocation density where the dislocations accumulate at the edge of grains, increasing the stress along the neighboring grains. This results in the bands to increase in width until it's propagated throughout the whole material. Once looter bands have formed, it will resume normal deformation until the sample fractures, as seen right here. Serrated flow is similar to the yield point phenomenon, however, it's a more dynamic process. It's normally caused by interstitial or in some cases substitutional atoms diffusing to dislocation cores fast enough to repin dislocations after initial yielding. This occurs at slow strain rates as there's a higher likelihood of finding a dislocation that can be immobilized. A common occurrence is a negative strain rate sensitivity where the stress needed to deform a sample decreases as strain rate increases. This differs from homogeneous yielding, whereas the strain rate increases, so does the stress. Serrated so flow, as seen on the figure to the right, is a temperature control process. We can see that for these processing tech, um, conditions, at 473 Kelvin and at 973 Kelvin, there's no serrations. However, in a certain temperature range, in this case around 773 degrees Kelvin, serrations will appear. Also, based on the forming and processing conditions, different types of serrations will occur. In nickel-based superalloys, type C serrations, which occur at high temperatures and low strain rates, and are caused by the dislocation unlocking from a solute atmosphere, can usually be seen. So a little bit of an outline for my presentation today is I'll first be sharing the two materials I'll be working with, followed by some findings on how to reduce the thermal gradients based on sample geometries and machine optimization. Then I'll share some initial characterization for Alloy 10, followed by what the next steps, challenges, and opportunities for this project are. The first material I received is Alloy 10, which is a powder processed nickel-based super alloy characterized by its especially good creep resistance at high temperatures. 
This alloy was especially formulated by Honeywell to improve upon the alloys previously used to manufacture turbine engine blades. It's a hip processed alloy and was sent to us without any post processing. The images here are the stock material obtained from the turbine blade, which, we could be, which can be seen on the upper left hand side. Grain size calculations were conducted using ASTM E112 and more specifically the linear intercept method along with Abrams three circle procedure was used. From these calculations and from these procedures, the alloy 10 has a received grain size of ASTM 6 or 7 or around 35 to 50 microns. The next material we received was ATI 720PM, which is manufactured by ATI. This material is vacuum induction melted and was atomized, which was then collected and formed using hot isostatic pressing. It's seen in the table that the composition of the alloy is shown, and aside from any processing differences, one of the biggest differences between ATI 720 and alloy 10 is that it doesn't contain any tantalum. This material was sent to us without any further processing or heat treatments, and in its as-received condition, has a grain size of ASTM 5 or 6, or around 53 microns. To conduct tensile tests to observe serrative flow, the Gleeble will be used. This is a machine that heats samples by conduction and is known to have high thermal gradients. As the serrative flow is a temperature-dependent process, it's important to have constant temperature across the sample. In the initial stages of thermal gradient testing, there was no size constraints, and cylindrical specimens with the shown geometry were used, with the only differences being the gauge length. Samples were machined out of 304 stainlets that has similar strength properties to that of nickel-based superalloys, with one sample having a 10 mm gauge length and the other one having a 40 mm gauge length. These sample designs allow for testing free span, which is the distance between the grips that are unsupported. For all the tests shown in this presentation, the heating profile shown, um, shown in this figure was used. A heating rate of around 10 degrees Celsius per second was chosen as this provides consistent heating and is well in the capabilities of the Gleeble. Additionally, these tests were conducted with no deformation and force control was used to ensure the sample did not experience any stress during thermal expansion. So this graph here shows the results from this free span test, and we can see that the largest temperature difference in the sample in Celsius is on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. From the graph, it's seen that a larger free span is favorable to reduce thermal gradients, and at the largest thermal gradients, which is at the very end of the test, the longer free span decreased the thermal gradient by over 100 degrees Celsius. After this free span testing, sample size constraints were introduced and the geometries shifted to dog bone samples. These sample designs were based around ASTM E8 subsize specimens, which were modified based on the free span results and to minimize stress concentrators at the transition between the grip section and the gauge section. The thickness of the sample was based around the stock material size, and for the setup, the thermal couple placement can be seen in this bottom figure. Thermal gradients should be the same on each side of the specimen, so only one half of the gauge length needs to be monitored. And for all the experiments, the middle thermocouple, or TC1, was the control. Aside from the geometry considerations of the samples, equipment modification can be utilized to reduce the thermal gradient. Grips in the Gleeble are cooled with the use of a chiller, and from previous tests, it was determined that the middle of the sample is hotter, while the edges are colder. To combat this, chiller temperatures were adjusted to, dis to see the change in thermal gradients. From this plot here, it's seen that at higher temperatures, a higher chiller temperature will result in a lower thermal gradient. While there's some inconsistencies at lower temperatures, it's seen that in most nickel-based superalloys, serrated flow occurs around 200 to 800 degrees Celsius. As this is the temperature range of interest, it could be concluded that a higher chiller temperature will result in a better thermal gradient. Other than thermal gradient testing, some initial characterization of alloy 10 has been started. These micrographs are backscattered electrons taken with the ESEM. And the micrograph on the left shows the gamma grain size, and from this we can see that there's an even size distribution with an average grain size of around 50 or 35 to 50 microns. The graph on the right shows in more detail some secondary phase present. This brightness in the sample corresponds to a high Z number, and it's theorized that these are carbides. Additionally, we can see that the gamma prime phase also has an even size distribution. So these results are a really great jumping off point to start deformation testing. Initially, room temperature deformation testing should be conducted at slow strain rates with the intent to see the base microstructure we should see after straining, so that then we can compare these to elevated temperature testings. Aside from the initial tensile testing, there should also be some more characterization of alloy 10 and ATI 720. Initial microstructure of the gamma phase should be attained for the ATI 720, 
then EBSD should be conducted on both materials to gain information on the gamma stored energy, gamma prime coherency, and the gamma prime fraction versus temperature. Moving forward, I need to gain training on the FISEM and the FIB and to also gain techniques for EBSD to gain the desired information that I was talking about in that previous slide. Additionally, while a preliminary testing matrix for percent gamma prime versus temperature has been started, a finalized testing matrix along with the training on the dilatometer for heat treatments is needed. Future work could also compare a powder processed ATI-720 to a rot processed ATI-720 to see how processing conditions affect the onset of serrated flow. Lastly, as the sample geometries has been finalized, I'll need to start a partnership with a machining company to manufacture my tensile specimens as well as the samples to be used in the dilatometer. Thank you, for, thank you so much for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, please let me know.